All right, well, why don't we go ahead and get started. Um, good afternoon again, and welcome to the Ops Track. Um, thank you for, uh, for joining us. Um, the session is Enforcing Service Mesh Structure Using Gatekeeper, and so Sandeep from Google Cloud, take it away. Thank you very much. Can you all hear me okay? Sounds good, all right. All right, thanks for joining, thanks for coming out. Uh, this is Enforcing Service Mesh Using OPA Gatekeeper, or one of the last sessions between you and a long nap. So I'll try to keep it lively, but this is probably not a terribly exciting topic, right? Who's really psyched about IT governance and applying controls to Kubernetes, right? Yeah, okay, all right, good. All right, uh, my name is Sundip. Uh, I work at Google Cloud. You can find me on GitHub or Twitter at CircusMonkey minus the vowels. Feel free to tweet awesome things about this talk throughout. It'd be great. All right, so let's start with policies. What are policies? Well, policies are rules, right? We are attempting to sort of define a set of rules that tell us whether we can make changes to a resource. That's really it when you boil it all down. Well, then what's policy management, right? It's really the act of authoring, developing, deploying, and you know, using those policies in a, you know, in a cluster environment or in, in kind of a, a deployment of some type. So when I talk about policy management, there's often this kind of mental overlap with something like config management. And the two are pretty closely related, but they're definitely distinct, right? Ultimately, config management is about how you store, control, govern resources or, or objects, right? There's typically a process around who can do config management, um, right? And you usually would do that with like Kubernetes RBAC controls. And there's a process around who can do it, or I'm sorry, a process around how to do it. So something like GitOps. Right? That's typically the approach with config management. Policy management, again, is about the rules. It's about what you can change and whether you're allowed to make that change. Uh, in some cases, it could be something where you say, I'll allow a change, but I'm going to audit any potential violation outside of the bounds I've kind of set up. There's a little bit of, again, mental overlap as well between policy management and some of what Kubernetes RBAC offers. But the distinction really comes down to, RBAC is about who can do something, and policy management is about what you're trying to change, right? the change you're trying to make. Right? So that's a good way to sort of balance out the difference as you sort of think about it. What we've found, and I think everybody in the room probably agree, Kubernetes is an incredibly powerful and complex distributed system, which means it does need some level of guardrail, some level of control. right? need to be able to exert some kind of manageability around it, because you want to watch out for things like overexposed services that are open to the world or open to every other service within the cluster. Right? You're going to worry about things like data exfiltration. Right? You don't want your data or your customer's data leaving your cluster. Right? And those are things that can happen with an improperly configured. And, and maybe even you configured it correctly at the starting point, but over time, the configuration has drifted in some meaningful way. And you've got to watch out for that sort of thing. But the controls that we put on to sort of lock things down and, and exert some, some sort of manageability really do need to be agile and flexible. They've got to be easy to work with, otherwise no one's going to adopt them, right? So you want to make sure that you've got the right people who are writing some of these policies. You want the people who have the visibility in the services, know the APIs, understand the software that's running on there to write these sorts of policies. They should be the ones that are driving the rules, right? It's a really important component. Um, you want to be able to scope those policies very narrowly. You want them to only apply to the stuff you care about. You don't want them broadly applicable, unless that's the way you designed it. But in most cases, you're trying to say, I just want to focus on one object and make sure that object doesn't change. Right? I want to make sure that the metadata of a particular object doesn't change. Or I only want to restrict any changes you know, or any violations to this one particular namespace. So scoping is also really important. Because at the end of the day, you're trying to make sure things in production stay safe. You're trying to avoid breakage once it's out of your hands. <clears throat> Excuse me. All right, so how do you enforce structure in a Kubernetes deployment? So you start with open policy agent. OPA is uh, part of the CNCF. It is a general purpose sort of rules, evaluation rules engine. Um, it's got all the typical things you'd expect to be part of the CN, you know, the cloud-native ecosystem. One, it's obviously declarative, 
you know, two, it, it sort of unifies and distinguishes to a degree, right, the development of applications and the guardrails that you need to put on those applications, right? It distinguishes between the configuration of the cluster and, again, the guardrails you want to put around the configuration of the cluster. And it's aware of everything that's going on within that environment as well, right? It's context aware to what's happening. So this is a, a good, powerful place to start. And, and OPA is, again, like I said, very general purpose, right? It's, it's not actually a part of Kubernetes as a standalone. It's just a mechanism for evaluating. So you can layer this into a number of different ways, right? There's even actually ways to make OPA an admission controller just by itself, uh, but we'll get to how that kind of fits in the broader term. But, but ultimately, any service can talk to Open Policy Agent and query against it, and Open Policy Agent is, is, kind of satis is given things like rules and configuration objects that it has access to, and then it can answer that query back based on the rules you've given it. So where does Gatekeeper fit in? So Gatekeeper takes OPA, takes Open Policy Agent, and essentially wraps it into a Kubernetes controller, and specifically a Kubernetes admission controller. So it puts itself right in the critical path of when objects are entering into the cluster. So it gives you the opportunity to potentially evaluate anything that's coming in, anything that the API is gonna accept, and make a decision about what's gonna happen to that. And so because Gatekeeper makes OPA part of Kubernetes at that point, all of the standard Kubernetes tooling that you would typically use to talk to your environment stays the same. kubectl, CICD, GitOps, generic API clients, whatever the case may be. What Gatekeeper does, right, again, it kind of extends the approach that that Open Policy Agent gives you. So with OPA, you write your rules in Rego, and then you just give that to OPA and it, and it executes those rules based on inbound queries. <clears throat> with Gatekeeper, you have to do a little bit more work. You take that rule object, that, that Rego code, and you embed it inside a custom resource. And then you give that to Gatekeeper. So now Gatekeeper knows about a new CR in the cluster, and then it can build constraints based on that rule you just gave it. And we'll go into more depth as we kind of make our way through here. So what does a policy object look like? And before I go too far into this, the way policies work, the way they're managed, the way they're enforced, there's two parts to this. One is the set of rules that you're, that you're writing, and the second part is the enforcement. So the first part, the rules section, is called a constraint template. And that's an example I've got up here. Oops, jumped ahead a little bit. So this, this policy object, if you look about a third of the way down up, up, the, up the top there, you'll see there's a kind. So what that's actually saying is, we're gonna create a new CR, and it's gonna incorporate the rule, the Rego code that's underneath at the bottom there. So when I apply this to Gatekeeper, what's gonna happen is that there is a new top level type, right? If you do kubectl, get CRDs, you'll see that there's a new one called destination rule TLS enabled. And so the reason that you separate this idea between the policy and the enforcement of that policy is because depending on the type of policy you have, it may be parameterized, right? You may be able to say things like, for a particular namespace, I need to have these three labels on every incoming deployment object. Well, depending on the namespace, you, want to, you may want to change what that looks like. So in that case, you may have a single constraint template, right, a single set of rules that does the actual checking but then in each namespace you care about, or scoped to each namespace you care about, you may have a new individual constraint object that lets you, again, operate and, and scope it to those parameters in particular. So the second half, as I mentioned, is a constraint object. And a constraint just takes that CR you created, it creates that same top level type, and this is where you get to define the enforcement and the scoping of that rule you just created. So in this example, we have an enforcement action of deny. So that's gonna tell the admission controller that if any object comes in that violates the rule on the previous slide, just kick it right back out. Give it a nice error message and then send it on its way. But you also have the opportunity to audit incoming objects and say, look, this is a soft guardrail. It's not something that's gonna break production, but it's something we might wanna know about later on. 
So you can change this and, and change it to audit mode, so it'll accept those objects, and then you have the ability to go and check audit violations or status violations later on. The bottom half down here, or the bottom section, is where we scope it. So we say, you know, we're telling it now, this is where you apply this constraint to, or this constraint in this set of rules. So in this case, I'm scoping it to a, de a destination rule, which is one of the APIs that are part of Istio, and I'm gonna say it's only gonna focus on the default namespace. But, just like a lot of the great tools we have in the ecosystem, you can get a lot more fine-grained here. We can actually specify a specific namespace selector based on things like labels. So I could actually say something to the effect of, hey, I only want to focus on namespaces where this particular metadata set, or in this example that's commented out, only namespaces where Istio injection is enabled. So you have that ability to really focus down where you want to apply that enforcement, which is good. You don't want to have too many objects that are applying to every single thing coming through because they're probably not fine-grained enough, they're probably not really gonna give you the constraint you're looking for. So there's one more piece to this puzzle when you're talking about Gatekeeper, is that you've gotta actually tell Gatekeeper how to capture some of these objects. And so, to use the namespace selector that I just showed on the previous slide, you've gotta make sure that you're synchronizing, you're syncing the data about namespaces into the Gatekeeper system namespace. So the gatekeeper controller is basically caching uh, the metadata about any of these objects. And the reason you do this is because you may have one for the namespace selector, as I mentioned, so it's gotta know about all the namespaces and all, all those metadata. But for any objects that may have multi-object policies or for any situations where you may want to audit something after it's been admitted to the cluster, gatekeeper system needs to know about it or the gatekeeper configuration needs to know about it. So this, this file is pretty, pretty typical. Um, most of the time in the examples, you'll see something that just got you know, namespace, service, pods, deployments, that sort of thing. In this case, I added a few extra lines for some of the Istio APIs that I was concerned with. All right, so how do we apply enforcement to Istio or to service mesh? Who's familiar with service mesh in the room? Good, all right. How about Istio? Okay, awesome, awesome. Who's got Istio in production, just out of curiosity? Okay, <laughs> decent amount of people. <laughs> Not as good as I was hoping, it's okay, it's okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, so typically a service mesh, right, it has a sidecar, it sits you know, right next to your services, and it helps create kind of this approach where you can, uh, independent of those services, independent of the code that's running in your applications, you know, automate network functionality. Right, that's essentially it. Let you apply sort of network automation across the board to a large, to a large kind of pool of, of applications and services. Specifically with Istio, right, out of the box you get a pretty decent amount of observability. So telemetry, logs, tracing. Uh, you get traffic controls, which I think I called operational agility because that sounded really cool. Uh, and then you also get like a policy-driven security approach. And I apologize that there is an Istio object called policy in here that I will be referencing several times. So if you're confused between which policy thing I'm talking about, feel free to find me after, and I will help try and disambiguate ever so slightly. So if you kind of dig in a little bit in depth with Istio, observability, I mentioned logs, tracing, you know, telemetry and monitoring data. Uh, for traffic, you get to do anything to those services as, as it relates to the flow of traffic coming in or out of your services. That's what that sidecar does. And it also includes things like the ability to do rate limiting, circuit breaking, canaries, all that sort of good stuff, traffic steering. Um, and then with security, there's a pretty solid authentication and authorization model. And the authentication component includes the ability to encrypt all the traffic between services as well. So it ends up being a pretty powerful mechanism. As I mentioned earlier, I often like to think of service mesh and specifically Istio as ultimately network automation at scale. But for any, again, complex, powerful distributed system, and I think Istio I and mean, service mesh in general sort of qualifies, people typically have really good intentions, right? You're trying to do something compelling, but you have to watch out for problems, right? Things happen. You can't always control what's gonna happen, right? You may have pushed a good config into Git. That may be the config that got synced to the cluster. But somebody in the room may have cluster admin access and may have 
patch that config, or maybe I've changed something, or maybe they pushed an object, and maybe they broke something, right? Breakage can happen anywhere. It's not just gonna happen with one team at the, you know, all the way shifted left. It, it could happen anywhere along that pipeline, because ultimately, teams have, you know, a mix of declarative and imperative access to Kubernetes. So you've gotta watch out for that sort of thing, and that's really what we're trying to enforce. It's not just, you know, potential breakage on the far right, but it's also kind of shifting left over time. All right, so I'm gonna talk through a few examples of sort of structural problems you can run into with Istio. Um, some of these are sort of self-inflicted, and some are guardrails you might wanna set up in, in advance of, of uh, you know, again, deploying to production. So one of the first ones is there's a requirement in Istio today, and I can talk about that a little bit later, but today there's a requirement in Istio that if you want your pods and services to be picked up by the service mesh, you have to follow a very specific port naming convention, right, in your service port. So you can see down here, I didn't follow that convention, right, you have to actually label it with the protocol as the prefix. You have to tell it HTTP, gRPC, TCP, what have you. So in this case, if I were to deploy this service, it actually would not be able to route traffic to it. Or it would route traffic to it, but it wouldn't use any Istio routing rules, I should say. So this is something that we want to catch. This might not be something we deny admission into the cluster for, but it's certainly something we want to be able to audit and again, trace it back as a potential problem in our deployment over time. All right, so the next one is uh, enforcing MTLS. So you can write a top level sort of Istio policy object that says, hey, for everything in the namespace that I apply this policy object to, all the services, they must only accept MTLS connections but there is actually an ability to override this at the host level. You can say, again, within that same namespace where I've said all services must accept MTLS, I can write another policy that says, hey listen, I'm special, my service is special, I don't want to accept MTLS connections, I want to go permissive. Right? So you can actually do this. And now, that service at backend will actually accept unencrypted connections, or unauthenticated connections, I should say. So this is another thing you wanna be able to catch, right? And this isn't really a structural problem, it's more of something where you may have a corporate policy that says, hey, listen, we're only doing MTLS, right? It's compliance, it's regulatory, what have you, right? It's about safety. Someone can still override that. Another one is a, a mismatched MTLS situation. We've seen this before in the field as well, where you may have something, in a, again, a situation where in a host, you've told, you've told services only accept MTLS connections, but then a destination rule, which controls what clients do in Istio, a destination rule comes in and says, I'm gonna disable MTLS, right? I'm telling clients that they don't have to use MTLS. And now the problem is that service is expecting an authenticated connection, clients aren't supplying one. So then what happens? You end up with 503s, right? This is a situation where, and even like the previous one, you probably wanna deny admission to objects that do this sort of thing, right? Not even just because it's about security, but this is gonna be something that's end user facing, right? If you break some of these MTLS settings in your deployment, it's impacted by your end users. So another one is authorization controls. So Istio's got a pretty rich authorization model, and in fact, this is now a deprecated approach as of this week, so thanks, Istio team. Uh, we switched from using the service role, service role binding to a much cleaner and sort of tighter authorization policy object, but that's okay, I left the example in there. Uh, the point is, is that with the authorization model, you can do interesting things like service A can talk to service B, A can talk to C, but B can't talk to C. Right? You can write that easy config in your deployment. And you may have a situation where you say, hey, there's a front end and it's gotta to talk to its back end, but no one else should talk to that back end. Right? You may wanna lock that access down. And maybe you did, you wrote the config the right way and then someone was debugging or trying to open up service and they changed something and they took out that source principle and they said, hey, we don't care about that service account, we'll let anybody connect to this back end. Right? One, just a potentially bad idea because you may not be prepared for the extra connections. Worse yet, it could be something where you need to lock down access. You don't want other parties talking to it from inside the deployment. 
So I think this is the last one. Uh, virtual services. So virtual services are what control uh, some of the east-west traffic within a deployment. So this is actually telling traffic essentially how to go from you know, sort of point A to point B in a cluster. Well, virtual services are really powerful, except we don't check them for you on the way in. So what might happen is someone may actually have a URIs that are clobbering all over each other. So if you were to push both of these objects into the cluster, you're only going to technically route traffic to one host because these files look very similar. These objects look very similar, right? I'm saying for all hosts, you know, and if the URI matches slash hello, send it to version one or version two. Well, which one of these is actually going to work? It's sort, of un it's sort of unknown, right? Depending on the day, it might be the first one or the second one. So that's not really a great use case because now different teams may be wondering why their traffic is getting, you know, uh, picked up by some other service. So that's another thing you want to watch out for. All of these examples are things that we can catch in advance. We can either reject admission to the cluster if they violate, again, a corporate policy, regulatory, compliance, security, or they could just be good things for us to audit and capture and be able to check up on and fix later on. So some other interesting, I think, policies, and this gets into more of the, the sort of guardrails and governance stuff, but it talked about requiring strict MTLS between clients and services in a specific namespace, locking down that fine-grained authorization control to make sure that you're not allowing anyone to talk to your services, but only a very specific sort of source or destination. You may have policies that are specific about telemetry settings because you don't want to lose telemetry. It may be very important for your own business's audit controls. Right? It may be really important for you to make sure that logging is always turned on or that you're getting certain metrics so that you know uh, when things are going down or when you need to you know, adjust resources. So there's a whole bunch of these, and we're not going to talk through all of them right now, but there's a lot you can do with Gatekeeper. I can't stress that enough. It is an incredibly powerful mechanism, right? and it's a really powerful tool to make sure things don't break, and that's really what you're trying to avoid. So if we add Gatekeeper to Istio, we get that strong structural approach. So now I'm going to try to do a couple of demos for you. Uh, I've got five demonstrations. Anybody seen a demo of an admission controller before? Yeah, it's not terribly exciting because you push something, and then it doesn't get admitted to the cluster. That's pretty much the end of it. So, you know, hopefully I don't lose any of you while I'm doing this, but we'll see how it, how it looks. So let's see. The first thing we're going to do here is I'm just going to run my little demo script. All right, so the first thing we'll do is we're going to check and see what's in the cluster, just so I can show you all in advance. And I just now realized that I left a bunch of stuff running in the cluster. That's all right. We'll figure it out. All right, let's check some pods. So there's just a couple of there's a couple of little services running here, nothing, nothing important. Um, we'll show some of the services that are running. All right, this is just basic stuff. But now let's look at what's in the entire thing. So this is actually what's deployed in the cluster. So I've got Istio deployed in the Istio system namespace. Obviously, there's a bunch of GKE and Kubernetes stuff in there. And at the very top, the second line, is Gatekeeper. So Gatekeeper is installed uh, just by using the normal instructions that are on GitHub, and it installs in its own namespace Gatekeeper system. And so if you remember earlier when I talked about there's two parts to a policy, right? There's the rule and then there's the enforcement of that rule. So what I've done in advance is I've actually pushed all my rules into the cluster. So I'm actually showing all the constraint templates. I've already pushed those into the cluster because in production in the real world, what you may be doing is you may already have those templates living in the cluster, right? Some, somebody from like security ops may have written all these rules for you and then push them in the cluster and they're ready and waiting for any service team or any you know, platform team that wants to actually use them by uh, writing a constraint to enforce them. All right, so the first one we'll do is can we check for bad port naming conventions, right? That was an example I mentioned earlier. So let me take a look at what that template looks like. So this is a bad port naming template. And if I turn a page down here, you'll see the Rego code at the bottom, right, that bottom half. I'm not going to read through this line by line for you, but effectively what I'm doing is I'm pulling out the service that came in, and I'm checking. I'm just kind of going through the object, and I'm trying to figure out what the port name starts with. 
and if I can compare it against uh, a known set of input parameters. So let's take a look at the, the corresponding constraint object. So you'll see this one, the enforcement action here on, uh, what is that, line six, is set to dry run. Dry run is essentially saying, allow admission to a service that might violate this constraint and audit any breakage, right? Audit any potential violations. And then you'll see down there as well, the namespaces I've chosen for this are the Istio system, I'm sorry, any namespace where Istio injection is enabled, which in my case is just the default namespace. And then I've got a set of parameters that I need it to correspond to, right? These are my input parameters. So I'm saying ports must start with one of these names. So let's push the constraint into the cluster. All right, that was already in there, because like I said, I just ran this about 30 minutes ago, but that's okay. And let's take a look at a bad port name object. So if you look over here at the very top, this is an example I showed earlier in the slides, but the port name is hello port, right? I don't have any of those uh, well-known prefixes. So this, will, this deployment will actually get a sidecar proxy as part of Istio, but it won't actually respond to traffic rules because I've got a bad port name. So now let's see what happens if I push that into the cluster. That's gonna go in. All right, well that was already there. And the next thing is, let's take a look at the constraint object that I created. So it ends up being a little bit long, right? Because you actually have to refer to the entire full path of it. So what I'm saying is, I wanna get the, that CR, that container, that cluster resource, allow service port name constraints gatekeeper.sh, get the specific port name constraint I gave it, take a look at it in YAML, and I'm gonna watch it for any status changes. Because in the status field, down here on the lower third of the screen, you'll see there's a couple of violations noted. Right? We actually have a situation where it says, uh, well, the Kubernetes service by itself already is the wrong one as well, but the service hello world, the default port name, is it's missing a prefix. Right? So this is an example of one where we did dry run. This was, we're gonna block admission to the cluster for this, but we wanted to be able to audit because this could be a reason that things aren't working like we expected. All right, so the next one I wanna talk through is mismatched MTLS settings. And this one is interesting because if you look about, let's see, line 17, this kind of, you know, the templates kind of start to blend together for a while. And again, I'm not gonna go through the Rego code in depth, but this template is a good example of, I'm evaluating a destination rule coming in, but before I can evaluate that destination rule, I need to check for a corresponding Istio policy object that might already be in the cluster. So the first thing I'm gonna do is, I'm actually gonna pull out of the sort of inventory, I'm gonna pull out any policy objects and make sure I kind of iterate through them and check for any places where the policy object specifies a host name and that it's strict MTLS, you know, and the destination rule is saying the same host name, but it might be saying disable MTLS. So that's what this policy is doing. So now if we take a look at that constraint, this one's not as exciting, because uh, it's very simple. But ultimately, the distinction here is that, again, in line six, I want to deny admission to this object. I don't want to allow a destination rule that attempts to turn off MTLS. So we can push that constraint into the cluster, and then we can try, okay, so this is what the, the policy and destination rule look like. As I mentioned, the policy on the bottom says strict for that particular target, and then the destination rule is trying to disable MTLS here. Uh, let's see what happens. Policy goes in, destination rule gets. Uh -oh. Okay, well that didn't work. So I apologize, I will check on that later. Um, that one I think is already in there because I broke it earlier. So I will double check it. Um, so the next one, and we will make our way through here. So here's another good example. Uh, this is one where we might wanna say, hey, I have a corporate policy that says 
MTLS must be on in a particular namespace for all services. Now, what's interesting about this policy is that you can see that the sort of violation conditions kind of go on and on here. And there's a reason for that. So one, the way it works in Rego is if you have multiple different ways that a violation can be thrown, you need to specify them in sort of different violation you know, functions or, or sort of groupings. And what happens is if any of the, when you, when you do it this way where you have you know, separate, separate blocks of violations, they get ORed together. So if any one of these throws, it'll throw a violation. And so in this case, I've got three different options here because the way you specify MTLS in an Istio policy object is a little weird. You actually have to specific, like I'm specifically checking for different combinations of uh, the API object to make sure that it's gonna qualify here. Right? I need to check for, uh, for example, in, in this, if you don't specify the spec.peers field, then it's actually turning off MTLS. Right? If you don't, uh, if spec.peers is just an empty array, it also attempts to turn off MTLS. And then finally, if it's set to permissive, that's obviously explicitly turning it off, but there basically there are a couple implicit ways to turn it off, so you need to make sure you check for all possible conditions. All right, so let's push that constraint in. Uh, this one looks very similar to the last one where we're just denying admission to the cluster. So let's try that and let's see if this one works. All right, so the constraint's in there, and we're gonna take a look at a bad policy object here. So this is one that we're trying to catch. So, good. So we're gonna try to push this one in, and let's see what happens. All right, so here's an example where the admission controller caught it and said, sorry, gatekeeper said, no thanks, you can't get in here because you're violating this rule that I'm not gonna read out to you, but it's basically a bunch of error message. Now, what's also interesting about this one this constraint in particular, is that there was already a bad policy object in the cluster that I left there from earlier on purpose. So this is a good example of a constraint that, again, I wanted to deny admission, but denying admission, that, that enforcement action deny, also does the audit for you as well. So on the off chance, someone was somehow able to bypass the admission controller or had a pre-existing object, it'll still get picked up in the violation field. So you can still go track this back down and say, who over here owns this object and let me go tell them to pull it or let me pull it down or change it because they're violating, again, corporate policy here. All right, so I'm gonna stop here and I wanna finish up on the slides. All right, so we didn't cover all of them. Uh, Preventing virtual service hostname collisions, uh, requiring services to disable unauthorized access. I apologize, we're gonna run out of time. So what I would say though is, I have a link to the GitHub repo where all of these are, um, with kind of a little bit more example and a, more, a little bit more information. Please take a look at them. I'm hoping to eventually push them into the gatekeeper sort of uh, contrib policy library so that we can start creating a large base of these things uh, to share with everybody. So one more thing I did wanna mention is Policy controller, right? What is policy control? Well, so policy controller is actually part of Anthos config management, right? Anthos is Google's sort of hybrid Kubernetes uh, multi-cloud software, right? It's a giant package of stuff. In there, particularly, is one component called Anthos config management. So Anthos config management does uh, GitOps, right? That's essentially what it is for your clusters and for your deployments. As of, I think, Anthos 1.1, so a couple of months ago, we included something called policy controller. Policy controller is based on Gatekeeper. Right? And the reason I mention this is because Gatekeeper is growing in its popularity and its usage. We are now including it as a core part of one of our biggest you know, products as well in cloud. So I think you're gonna see a lot more of these policies and objects. I strongly urge you all, if you have any kind of IT governance regulatory, compliance. If you just have people who are freewheeling and like to push objects into your cluster all day long and need to set some rules, take a look at Gatekeeper. It's incredibly powerful. Uh, before I leave you, I do wanna mention there's a handful of links here. These are all on the slides. Oh, if you downloaded the slides already, do it again because I changed a bunch of stuff in the last two days. So grab them again uh, from the link there. But uh, you can check my GitHub repo for now. That's where those policies are. Once I get them into the Gatekeeper contrib, I'll put a pointer and do all that stuff. Uh, there's a link to Gatekeeper, there's a link to the Rego policy language, 
and then a link to the, the ACM docs page if you want to dig into it. The other thing I would mention, is there anybody from Styra in the room? Real quick, and no hands, hand, no hands. Okay, there's a couple of people back there, awesome. Listen, if you're gonna write Rego, they have this great tool uh, called the Rego Playground, which makes life so much easier. Uh, you get to just write your code and test it in a browser, it's really handy, and I strongly recommend you do it. Uh, if you wanna ask me any questions, I'm probably gonna get booted here right now, so I will be out in the hallway, come find me, I'm happy to hang out and answer anything for you. Thank you very much.